We're talking today with Leland Gonovan of Fort Bragg, California, not North Carolina, which I guess no longer exists now. Uh, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, begin with uh, the beginning. Uh, where and when were you born? Well, uh, my name is Leland Austin Ganyavin, and I was born in the spring of 1947 in Chicago, Illinois. Okay. And I was raised in an extended family household with my mother and father and my mother's parents, my maternal grandparents, in a rural area of some 50 miles north of Chicago, okay. in an area that would have made Tom Sawyer envious, 15 okay. freshwater lakes all connected by channels. Okay. Which, count, which county were you in? Lake County. In Lake County, so north of Chicago. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So all these lakes were, were connected by channels, and, uh, and our home sat on top of a uh, uh, pretty steep hill on three lots, and, it, and uh, surrounded actually by lakes on three sides. So growing up in the 1950s, it was just idyllic. Um, flat bottom wooden rowboats, cane pole, bobber, and a can of worms. And, and in the winter, we would ice skate what seemed like miles on the channels, and every day was a nature hike. And, and um, so it was a warm, loving, uh, extended family uh, gathering place that a lot of folks came out on the Milwaukee Road Railroad from Chicago and would spend um, you know, weekends with, with us. Okay. You know. And what was your family doing for a living at that point? Well, my uh, grandfather uh, was a lever man for Union Station in Chicago. And when he bought the property, he wanted to have access by rail so he could get to work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he retired uh, out on the property. And then my dad, who was a, a chief motor machinist mate in the Navy during World War II. And when he had met my mother in Chicago, she went out to Los Angeles and they got married. Mm -hmm. and, and I was born, obviously, you know, after the war. But he was a carpenter. He worked as a carpenter and built houses. So I learned the business end of a shovel pretty early in life. All right. And, uh, and then, did you finish high school? I did. I went to a relatively small high school. My graduating class in 1965 was, I think, 172 kids. So we, we knew a lot of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew each other uh, pretty well. And we still, many of us are still connected. And what year did you graduate? 1965. Okay. And what did you do after that? I failed miserably trying to go to college. I was not, um, you know, um, emotionally mature enough, I think. Um, and I eventually flunked out of college after two attempts. I just wasn't really ready to go. And, and I was drafted, uh, you know, in the, uh, the end of 1968 and entered service uh, January 13th, 1969. All right. Now, uh, did you have a job someplace when you were drafted or just living at home? Well, I was living at home at the time, and um, I had been working as a, a drywall taper, finishing drywall. There was a man, family uh, friend, who taught me how to uh, finish drywall. So we would you know, do commercial and residential jobs as, you know, painting and, and, and drywall finishing, mm -hmm. so. All right. And now at the time you got drafted, how much did you know about Vietnam? Well, I knew there was conflicting information. You know, we did, obviously we did not have the social media uh, and the, the wide uh, amount of resources that we have today. So, um, you know, I was faced with a dilemma like anybody else. My, my, my godfather, uh, who was married to my mother's sister, who my, you know, was my godmother, and we were very close, but he walked across Italy in the infantry in World War II, and my father served, like I said earlier, in the United States Navy, and he was stationed at Pearl Harbor repairing ships. But, um, 
they had their reservations about the validity uh, of the war. But, you know, in those days, you know, um, our American institutions were working for us. You know, people trusted the government. And, uh, and when it came to family and school and church, you know, all, all of our mainstay institutions were, were viable. And although I was beginning to be disillusioned, uh, having uh, been old enough as a sophomore in high school when President Kennedy was killed, you know, I mean, we began to question um, what was, you know, what we could believe and what we couldn't believe. But I wasn't willing to run the risk of becoming a criminal or leaving my close-knit extended family going to Canada and becoming a fugitive. I mean, it just, it didn't feel at all right to me. And, um, because I had not been raised that way. And, um, so... I decided that it would be more prudent to roll the dice and, and two years in the service, and, which okay. meant obviously being drafted into the American Army, but um, All right. so that's did, the path I took. Okay. Now, uh, you had a physical someplace? Yes. I was inducted into uh, the Army in Chicago and went through the induction process in, in the physical and passed the physical. Okay. And, um, how serious was the physical? It didn't feel all that um, thorough, mm -hmm. I think, you know, because I had a heartbeat and, and no uh, apparent images or disabilities. Uh, the only potential limitation was my eyesight. I had pretty poor eyesight, but with glasses, I mean, it was just overlooked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they lined us all up. And, uh, and we had to count off up to four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I think all the fours were asked to take a step forward and they became the United States Marines. And the rest of us were inducted into the United States Army and, um, and then piled on, onto, uh, you know, transportation to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the home of the 82nd Airborne Division, and that's where I took basic training. Okay, so these days almost nobody goes in the service and they don't really know what basic training actually is. So can you describe what happened to you while you were there? Yes, um, that, was, uh, <clears throat> that was a rude awakening. That was a process of stripping all of us of whatever individuality we had, and they began um, the serious uh, retraining of us um, to be uh, soldiers and and to be um, able to face the harshness of, of combat and follow orders and uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, so it was abrupt. It was an abrupt change. Life as we knew it was over. And, uh, and, you know, I was somewhat through basic training or, you know, pretty deep into it, at least two, two or three weeks. And a friend of mine from high school had been killed that I played music with in the band and I played football with him in high school and we were, we were pretty tight. And after high school, there was four of us that uh, formed a little music combo, so we played a lot of private parties and uh, Christmas parties and weddings and so forth. And and I became willing to haul my drums at the time. I learned, I taught myself how to play drums, and and um, and I was willing to haul my drums anywhere and play with anybody. In fact, I ended up playing with our saxophone player's uh, father, who played saxophone, and and jobbed out until I was drafted. So the family had asked me to come home to be an honorary pallbearer. And of course I accepted. Mm -hmm. So that meant I had to be, I was recycled. Mm -hmm. I had to start basic training over again after that, uh, after the funeral. And it threw my cycle off. So when I graduated from basic training, I was not given orders for advanced individual training. And, and, um, 
and I was a holdover for a few weeks. So I spent time at, at, uh, at Fort Bragg working with a carpenter and we just went around doing, you know, odds and ends and odd jobs and, and such. And then one day they brought me into the orderly room and they said to me, how would you like to be a cook, right? And stay right here at, you know, beautiful Fort Bragg, uh, uh, North Carolina. And all I could envision was the pasty white skin, never seeing the light of day, wearing these white uniforms with the little, little white hats and greasy boots and, and the heat of the kitchen because we always had to do you know, KP and, and such, and uh, and I just, I couldn't do it. it. It just didn't feel that it was part of uh, who I was. And I, I wasn't willing to run the risk of telling my would-be son in the future, you know, Daddy, what did you do in the big war? And, and end up telling, well, I was a cook in Fort Bragg, you know, uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, so I said, no, I can't do that. And, and then I was on the fast track to uh, Tigerland at Fort Polk, Louisiana, given an infantry MOS. Okay. So let's back up a little bit. Uh, what was the actual basic training program like? What did you do there? How did they treat you? Well, it was rough. And, and uh, you know, if you had an unbuttoned button, um, they would cut it off. And if you were not shaved properly as they thought you should be shaved in the morning for the morning formation, you had to stand in line and dry shave with a razor of his choice of the, the and um, and you know, as we stood in a, at attention, your eyes needed to be straight ahead, and if you glanced or just looked sideways towards the drill instructor, he just got right in your face, and uh, and. Uh, that was something you wanted to avoid at, at all costs. So there was a lot of marching, a lot of running, a lot of physical training. And as we began to slowly, you know, go through the process of, you know, they stripped, obviously had stripped all of our civilian clothes off. Mm -hmm. Everybody got the same style haircut, short, and, um, and given, you know, all, all that we were required to have. And if the army didn't think that you needed it, you were not um, given it, you know. And um, and then we just went through the the rigors of learning, you know, a lot of drill and ceremony, a lot of uh, rote memorization. You know, they would teach us things as if we were all fourth graders, mm -hmm. you know, because they wanted each person, depending. Whatever, regardless of the level of their education, to understand and learn exactly what the Army wanted us to know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and were you in good physical shape when you went in? Yes, I, I was athletic. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I played football in, in high school and, um, and, um, and I ran track. I ran the low hurdles because I was fast uh, in, 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 uh, you know, in high school. And my father had been a, uh, a scoutmaster for the local Boy Scout troop, so I began camping at six years of age, going out with the scouts. And of course, I grew up in this rural environment. You know, we did a lot of uh, building of forts, climbing trees. You know, every, like I said, every day was a nature hike. Whatever was in season, we ate, you know, fruits and berries and apples and, you know, hickory nuts in the fall and, and uh, so it was not so uh, alien to me to be um, to, to go through the rigors of, of, uh, of training you know it was more just kind of the culture shock of going from your family environment into that yes that was the only real shock of it to me um, and um, and then by the time I was sent to Fort Polk Louisiana, that was our advanced infantry training, and that was the, that was the training ground for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, and at that point, I knew that I needed to be very serious and learn 
all the skills that might be required for me to survive this experience. And, uh, and I became committed at, at that. Okay. And so what did you actually do in AIT? Well, AIT was um, rigorous. You know, I had been used to August practices and football and the heat and the struggle. And, uh, but, but we were taught um, that we needed to depend on each other. And my equipment that was going to keep me alive needed to be maintained properly. And, um, and we went through a, a, a rigorous um, tr a physical training to prepare us, uh, complete with going into mock villages that they had set up and, and, and uh, water buffalo watering holes where you had to keep your, your head just up above this putrid water and try to look for weapons that they had planted under under the water on the on the ground, you know, to try to and, and you couldn't get out of the water until you found a weapon. And things like that. We learned rappelling um, out of helicopters off of platforms and um, and uh, of course we were taught all the armament that we would all the light weapons infantry armament everything from the 45 caliber pistol range to the heavy 50 caliber machine gun range, which was a long um, range and the targets were actually vehicles, armored personnel carriers or trucks. So we were taught how to fire all of these weapons and, uh, and, and there were confidence courses uh, that required us to muster up and find the confidence, develop the, the, the physical ability and the uh, mental uh, ability to uh, be confident in ourselves enough to perform the tasks that would befall us as an infantry soldier. And told things uh, very clearly, like in 1969 there was a 75 percent chance that we would be hit by something, whether, whether it would be shot by, you know, with a, with a bullet or shrapnel or some other gift that Charlie would prepare for us mm -hmm. in, in his blood sport. And, uh, and of course, first aid classes that I had remembered from being a Boy Scout, mm -hmm. you know, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, treat for shock, although now it was tracheotomy, tracheotomies mm -hmm. and, uh, and tourniquets and, uh, and you know, how to give uh, morphine shots and, and, you know, so they added a little bit more realistic uh, things on top of what I had learned as a Boy Scout. Right. So I had some skills that had prepared me for that, that harshness. And, uh, and my focus was more on, on the subtleties that I thought I would need, you know, to, to survive. Did any of uh, the drill instructors share any of their experiences from being in Vietnam? Yes. Our, our AIT instructors were all combat veterans. They all came back and, and they wore CIBs, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, I remember. All right. Uh, and then how long was AIT? Yeah, eight, I'm not eight, sure. Probably eight weeks. Yeah, right. I'm sure it was something like that. Um, and then finally after that, see, I, now I'm, my cycle is, is, has been thrown off, right. this training cycle. So I was, um, I ended up, well anyway, um, when, I, when I was, um, gra when I graduated from AIT, at the time there were some classes that were going to Korea, some classes went to Vietnam, and then the next week, Korea and then Vietnam, and Korea, Korea, or Vietnam, Vietnam, or whatever it was. Yeah. So we tried to figure out, gee, maybe we're going to get lucky and, and we'll all end up in Korea, you know, and, and be able to cook an egg in a hot tank in, in uh, you know, outside of Seoul, Korea or something, you know, but not so. You know, we all got sent to Vietnam. And, um, and then we just dispersed as individuals. You know, we were done, you know. It got very quiet. Everybody knew 
the jig was up and uh, we went home for for our 30-day leave and uh, and then I was given orders to report to Fort Polk, Louisiana and um, had acquired uh, a, a habit of you know what felt comfortable on me my uniform how I wore my boots and, and blouse my boots and um, and the type of civilian or not civilian but stateside fatigues that we wore so when I got to Fort uh, 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 Fort Lewis uh, Washington yeah. you know all of that was removed and I was given all this jungle uh, battle dress mm -hmm. and, um, and nothing felt right and I knew oh my goodness you know if I have to give attention to anything that that I'm wearing <clears throat> it's going to distract my attention from the business at hand and for me as an infantry rifleman that that meant being aware of booby traps being aware of all my surroundings you know and if it didn't sound right you know taught to kill it you know I mean and uh, <clears throat> so um, finally um, they loaded us, loaded us aboard a, a C-141 cargo plane and put us in cargo nets just um, we were government issue we were replacement parts with the other uh, gear and cargo that was going to Vietnam and uh, and we sat in the plane and faced backwards um, and flew nonstop uh, to Cameron Bay and uh, made the entire ocean crossing without stop. That's right in a C-141. Okay, that was a pretty big aircraft, right? Yes. 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 Okay, so that can maybe do that. Usually they stop someplace. Okay. I know. Mine, I don't remember us stopping anywhere. They just went straight to Vietnam and uh, we never got off that plane. All right. So what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? Well, coming to the door, I was hit with this this stifling heat and you know depleted oxygen you know we were used to 50,000 feet in, in the coolness of, of, of that altitude and um, and I looked uh, around me and I saw this this sea of uh, activity it was just busy busy enterprise um, big business enterprise and I thought now here it is capital gain on the backs of grunt labor mm -hmm. you know and all the Vietnamese uh, women look like 12 year olds and I thought boy this is going to be a long year and um, and we were always cautioned about black pajamas you know the Viet Cong wore black pajamas and you never knew where the enemy was and uh, there could be a bad you know a, 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 some kid with a, a grenade in a basket or something and uh, and all I could see around me were black pajamas and uh, you know bicycles and motor scooters and, and it's just it's massive amount of humanity and as we were coming off the plane in all our dark green um, attire here comes all the weathered faded green of, of, of the, uh, the returning soldiers you know our plane was now their freedom bird right and they were leaving and you know boy we got heckled and and, um, and some guys you know you know looked like you didn't want to be anywhere around those guys you know they their eyes were just sort of empty others had that long look they could look right through you and others were, most were, you know, pretty just jovial that they were getting out, you know, but the, the ones with the scruffed uh, boots, jungle boots with no more boot polish on them because we had been, you know, taught, you know, always polishing our boots, always shining belt buckles, always, you know, keeping our uniform just perfect in perfect uh, uh, order. But that was about the training of keeping your stuff in good working order because it's going to save your life, you know, and um, so that was the rude awakening, and um, and then I ended up in Benoit for my in-country training, and that was very serious. There was a, a couple of weeks of uh, acclimating us to our surroundings, 
And, and I remember specifically walking through a booby trap course. And if you tripped a booby trap, you know, a TNT pit went off, right? Um, and the only TNT pits up until that point that we had experienced was in AIT, we had to crawl under, under the wire. We came out of a foxhole and very close to the ground with your helmet on the ground holding your weapon, we crawled under the wire as they fired machine guns, live ammunition over us, and blowing TNT pits, you know, to get us used to what it would be like to be in combat. In fact, all of the, the, the rifle ranges with our M16s in AIT, targets would pop up randomly at different distances. And and to, uh, to hit the target, you had to react quickly. So we were taught it was a, it was a stimulus response, you know, because in World War II, soldiers often didn't fire their weapons because the targets were um, not, you know, everything was either in front of them or not in front of them, and they would run across open fields or whatever. And, uh, but to counteract that, uh, come the Vietnam War, you know, the training was, we need, we need to make sure that our infantry soldiers will react. And, and so those rifle ranges were designed to do just mm -hmm. that, you know. And, um, and I had fired expert with the M14 in basic training, and I fired expert with the M16 in AIT. You know, so I was confident, and uh, and I had I had what it took to uh, you know respond. You know, mm -hmm. and um, so as we walked through this booby trap course, there was a kid that tripped a booby trap, and out of nowhere, the uh, the range instructor jumped square into his face and told him just how dead he was, and and that this and he was physically putting his, his uh, slapping a, a, the next kid in the chest about, now, you know, you, this kid, you know, you, this guy lost his legs and this guy is dead and that guy is dead. And he walked through and he made that kid feel terrible. You know, I mean, we were not in Kansas anymore. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, this was about, uh, this was for pay. This was life and death. And, and there was no more coursing around, you know, so we tried to internalize as much as we could about what it was we were going to need to survive. So was this training run by the 101st or was this? No, 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 it was just, broader army for training? right, I had not been assigned to okay. any division yet. So then the next question was, well, who am I going to end up with? You know, the 196 Light or the 82nd Airborne or the 25th Infantry or the 1st Division? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then finally I got orders to the 101st Airborne Division, and I went, uh-oh, you know. I mean, these guys had a reputation, you know. This was a Strack outfit. This was, you know, you know, the battling bastards of Bastogne. These were the guys that jumped in Normandy. These, you know, these were tough guys, you know. And then I, I saw a guy in, with a, a Screaming Eagle patch, mm -hmm. and I said, Where's the 101st? And he said, up north. And, and then I said, well, how far? And he gave me the airborne slogan, right? You know, you, you know when, you, when you greet an officer, you'd say, good morning, sir, or good afternoon, sir, or good evening, sir, right? And the airborne would do airborne, sir, or all the way, sir, right? I mean, they had their own slang. Yeah. So when he said, when I asked him how far up north the 101st Airborne Division was, he told me all the way, and to me, you know, when I went the DMZ and, and all the way, and I'm thinking, boy, I, you know, are, the, are all these guys, you know, gung ho? I mean, dear mom, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I didn't make it. You know. So when was this? What time did when, when did you actually get to Vietnam? This was July 1969. Okay. And um, so. I had my orders, and on the day we were going to be transported up to Camp Evans, um, 
I had my duffel bag, and I think I still had an AWOL bag with me. And, um, and we were standing at this dusty crossroads, very hot, dusty. And we were waiting for the truck to come to pick us up to bring us to the, to the airstrip, to the, to the tarmac, uh, to, to, to fly north mm -hmm. to Camp Evans. I was going to Camp Evans, which was, you know, some 20 miles from the DMZ. And uh, so I had a great deal of trepidation about where I was headed. And, uh, and then we were told that if we wanted to, we could take our AWOL bags over to uh, a warehouse. So me and another guy decided to do that. We thought, well, we'll get out of the heat for a couple of minutes and maybe get a drink of water and turn our bags in. So when we got back to the, the dusty crossroads, um, they were gone. My duffel bag was gone. It was empty. So... I was forced to lay over a day and fly up north the next day. So the next day I flew up without any of my gear and I had had my contact lenses in my eyes now two days because uh, I had learned to play football, you know, the last year, you know, so I could see more than just color. You know, I could I'd literally read the numbers and see who the players were, you know. Other, other than that, uh, all I could see on the football field was just the different colors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was afraid because my enemy and us wore the same color, right? We were going to an area where the, it was the North Vietnamese regular army. It wasn't Viet Cong in their little black pajamas or anything. I mean, it was, this was serious business. And... Uh, so when we got on the C-130 to fly up north, you know, we were told that whenever there were two air, aircraft on the PSP <coughs> interlocking uh, runway uh, um, at Camp Evans, they got rocketed. And, and then the crew chief had said, oh, there's another aircraft on the runway. So we're not stopping. You know, you get ready, and when we lower the ramp, this aircraft is going to slow down, and you're going to jump off the back end of this aircraft, and we're leaving. And um, so they didn't get, you know, rocketed. Mm -hmm. And, 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 um, and um, so we all prepared to do that. And then all of a sudden they changed. I mean, they, they, they dropped this plane out of the air and landed it and changed it. You know, it was like changing a dime to two nickels. I mean, it was just that abrupt because it was a short runway. And I had never experienced anything quite like that. And, um, and as we went to get ready to jump off the thing, they realized that there were a bunch of body bags that they had to carry out, so they made a stop. Mm -hmm. And then we were told to, to, to run and, and find um, cover on the end of the, you know, a, on the side of the, the, the airstrip, which was just wide open. I mean, there was no ditch, there was no bunker, there was no nothing, but no rockets came and, and everything was, you know, um, uneventful. Mm -hmm. And then the jeep came. I was assigned to uh, to the second battalion of the 506th Infantry Regiment, and dropped off at their battalion headquarters. And there was this burly, hairy armed lifer E7 sergeant that wanted to know just where in the hell I have been and why was I late and was there any reason I couldn't go to the field immediately. And he was just like seething at me. And I went, well, I said, I don't have my duffel bag, I don't have my glasses and I've had contact lenses in my eyes for two days. If I take these out, I can't see this far in front of my face. I said, I need glasses. And that upset him. So he brought me into the their in S1 shop, you know, their, their office, and sat me down on a chair. 
and he sat down at his desk. He had a fan blowing on him, and all of his lackeys had fans blowing on him, and they were sipping on a Coke. And there was a little refrigerator in the office, so they all had cold cans of pop. And he was just looking at me. And then he said to me, he said, you're one of them college-educated guys, aren't you? And then I didn't know how to answer that. I figured, oh, I'm in trouble here. And, uh, and I said, well, yes and no. I said, yes, I did go to college, but I flunked out. So no, I'm not, you know, I didn't, never graduated. And then he said, well, do you know how to type? And I said, do I know how to type? I learned how to type, in, you know, Louis Orr's typing class in high school, and I beat this girl 72 words a minute, and I had one less misspelled words than her, and boy, do I know how to type. Yes, sir. Yes, Sergeant, I sir, surely do. So he says, well, we can't, we can't waste, you know, talent like, like you. We, you know, we got plenty of guys that can go to the field. And he, and he told one of his lackeys, get this man a Coke. And, uh, and then we became like long lost friends. And he was going to, he says, son, and says, I'm going to find you a job. And he started making phone calls all over the place trying to find me a job where I could type, you know, someplace where they, you know, they needed, needed help doing something. And, uh, and the brigade in headquarters company needed a legal clerk. So I became a legal clerk. Of course, I had not been trained in court reporting. I did not know shorthand. Um, and um, I went to one court martial. And um, there was a young kid, a young uh, black kid, as I remember, that had come in from the field uh, with his line company and was unlucky enough to get stuck on bunker guard for the night while the other guys, you know, were off and could rest and, and uh, drink some beer and stuff, and he fell asleep, so they court-martialed him. So I went to the court-martial, and, and I wrote a story about that experience. Some days later, as I was, you know, it was like a, a square peg in a round hole, mm -hmm. they tried to fit me into this, and I felt like, here I am, a trained infantry soldier, and, and I'm in this, you know, doing these meaningless tasks that, you know, with people that just, no one wanted to be there, and it just, it just was not a fit. And, uh, and I was counting the dead and the wounded and trying to, you know, with call signs, you know, uh, you know code to, to, to give numbers to different, you know, different companies, different battalions were calling into the brigade with their casualty counts and, and such. And all of a sudden, one day, Sergeant Major Bryson walked into the, the S1 shop there and he said, Sergeant White, he said, which one of your people embarrassed me in front of my colonel? Of course, I knew exactly who he was talking about. And I tried to slink down in my chair a bit, you know, and, and he came over. Now, Sergeant Majors in the 101st Airborne Division or anywhere in the Army own the Army. It is their Army. And they have the power to give or take away life. I mean, they're that powerful. I've seen Majors on down referred to Sergeant Majors as Sergeant Majors, sir, you know. And they Sergeants hate to be called, sir, I work for a living, right? So they always return that, that uh, honor, you know, with a, uh, a less than uh, suitable glance, as it were, to their, you know, ranking, a, a ranking officer over them. But they know, you know, how powerful they are and how much they need them. So he came over to me in a very quiet voice put his arm around me and he said, son, he said, did you write this piece of fiction? And I said, yes, Sergeant Major, I did. And he, said, he said, son, you've got a hell of a career ahead of you as a writer. <laughs> he <laughs> says, but this just isn't going to stand. You're going to redo this. You get my drift. You know, and I'm, 
And I said, yes, Sergeant Major, I certainly do, and I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can to make that exactly what you want so you can give it to your colonel and, you know, brigade commander and everything will be just fine. Of course, needless to say, that was the last court-martial that I ever attended, you know. And then there was one more quick stop, because I was part of this headquarters company, and they sent me to the headquarters company orderly room, and I, and I helped a company commander pass uh, uh, an inspection, an IG inspection. They had a prescribed load list in supply, right? And all their cards were out of sync, and they were all mixed up. So we worked really hard because he was he was determined to uh, pass the IG inspection. You know, so we did that. But you know, I just it wasn't a fit for me. And, and I, you know, and I would swear I'd make a mistake. Uh, you know, we had to roll these five, six copies of paper with individual carbon papers. You know, th through the typewriter. You know, with thin lines, and then if I you hit a wrong key, you had to you know, roll it up and open it up and, 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 and erase each page, you know, and then try to make sure the lines were all lined up so you could continue typing. And I would swear, you know, F the Army, you know, got, got you know, talk on it. And, and the company commander, because sat right behind me, he said, he said, he can't be saying that, you know. And I tried very hard, but. But I just was not a fit. And then I was on the, the fast track, you know, the, the Air Cavalry Platoon had been formed in September of 1969. This Air Cavalry Platoon was part of headquarters company, attached right to the 3rd Brigade Command. And it was made up of, uh, they took a seasoned or experienced men from the field. There was a, there was a lieutenant that was part of, uh, I think he was part of Echo Company, 2nd of the 506th. Um, and he had gone to the brigade commander and he said, I've got a great idea for a quick reaction and reconnaissance force. And, uh, and the colonel thought that was just a fine idea. And uh, so he looked for volunteers, first from his recon platoon in, in, uh, in Echo Company, Second of the 506, and some of the other, you know, line companies, and they formed uh, this quick reaction uh, reconnaissance force made up of 24 combat uh, soldiers, and uh, and the idea was now the brigade command had this uh, strack unit that could be deployed day or night. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 10 minutes standby, locked and loaded, on the pad, ready to go to either insert them to help a unit that was in trouble or secure a down helicopter or go out and find uh, sensor devices that had been dropped that would help guide, you know, uh, B-52 bombers and, and aircraft as they flew on one mission or another. And, um, and we ended up, um, here I was, you know, with my claim to fame was I just upset some um, rear echelon officers, you know, because I failed at typing. But uh, it was like a breath of fresh air for me. I, I, I was a, you know, I had fear, I had trepidation over what was laid out in front of me. And, and, and what these missions were going to entail, I was not quite sure. But, um, you know, I knew that's where I, I belonged. Intuitively, I just felt more at ease. At, at least they were doing something that had value in my estimation, you know. Were you assigned to that or you volunteered for it? No, no, no. I was, I was transferred. Okay. I, you're going. You okay. Know. All right. And so well, when did that happen? That was in the spring of of um, seventy. Of seventy. Okay. And um, at the time, now beginning in nineteen sixty nine, Richard Nixon had implemented this program of Vietnamization. So units that had been up on the DMZ in northern Icor in the Ashaw Valley, 
along, along that um, um, theater up mm -hmm. there had been removed. He was, the Marines had been pulled yeah. out. Other u Army units had been pulled out. He was sending divisions home. And anyone 30 days or under with that division went home with the unit colors. Others got transferred. So we were in the process of leaving Vietnam. We were in the process with Vietnamization of turning the government and the war effort over to the South Vietnamese. So our units were not being replenished. We were not at full uh, operating, you know, uh, uh, numbers. And the 3rd Brigade had three combat battalions that were essentially undermanned. And, you know, a, a line company was maybe 90 to 100 guys, and, and, a, and a battalion would be, what, maybe, you know, 400, 400 guys, right? And, um, and so... In the spring of 1970, while Vietnamization was being furthered, the commander of all forces in Vietnam ordered the commanding general of the 101st Airborne Division to conduct a blocking and disruptive operation against the North Vietnamese in what they considered their sanctuary, the Shaw Valley and the rugged double and triple canopy mountains of, of I-Corps. And, um, and into that vacuum created by the removal of all those other units, the MVA sent the 324B division in there with nine combat battalions plus a support division to augment the regimental units that had traditionally operated in the Ashaw Valley, which they considered their safe house. Mm -hmm. So my 3rd Brigade Air Cavalry Platoon during Operation Texas Star, which turned into this four and a half month long battle for our fire base ripcord because the 324B Division had been tasked with taking U.S. Operating Base number 935, so named for its height in meters, but that was our fire base ripcord. And of course, we used fire support bases for the forward command uh, to conduct our field operations, whatever those were. So Ripcord was the forward uh, operating um, uh, base for the command post uh, while Operation Texas Star was, was implemented. And, um, and, and really the second of the 506 was the tip of that spear. And of course my recon platoon of 24 men operated in either 12-man teams or 6-man teams. So, And we kept bumping into elements of this large NVA force. I mean, our first mission, we picked up and just began to move, never got off the ridge lane, but the, uh, the point man uh, killed an NVA soldier that was walking in towards us with a hot bag of rice and no gun. And he had brand new socks in his pocket. And they had blown a spider hole below us. And, and you know, that was all day before we could, get, we ended up having to call in an airstrike. Um, and we tried to bring in artillery rounds, but in the double and triple canopy in the rugged mountains, it's hard to know where that round is because you can say, you know, drop 25 or left 25 or, you know, drop 50 and, you know, you don't want to bring a bunch of uh, steel, exploding steel down, you know, on, on, on your position. So it was hard to locate where these rounds were being, you know. And, and we were just in this, most of the day it was a long fight and, and uh, so we ended up calling an airstrike. Long and short of it, we got out of there, but that was the start of my experience in this in this pitched battle. I had no idea I was part of this epic battle for Ripcord. Sure. When you first joined the unit, how did the other men treat you? Because you were a new guy with no. Well, they just thought, you know, there was no one that came into that unit that had not field experience. So I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want them uh, giving attention to me that, you know, um, 
would distract uh, from their focus, mm -hmm. you know. And I knew, um, you know, I said to myself, well, who is better suited for this work, you know? I don't know that yet, you know, because, you know, there's some soldiers that are really good at what they do, and there's others, you know, when you look at them, you don't want to go anywhere near them. You know, they don't have the right look, you know, and uh, or you don't trust them. And then there's others you kind of buddy up with, and, and uh, you know, and that, that first mission that, that I was going to go on, it was like a choreographed ballet that was just unfolding miraculously in front of me. Everyone knew their role, and uh, we were preparing weapons and, 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 and armament and loading uh, magazines and, and this 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 activity was just unfolding, you know, like, like it was choreographed. Everyone knew what their role was. And of course, I was out of my element, you know. I, I didn't know all that I needed. And, um, and, and one of the guys, I said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty new to this. And he says, I know, don't worry about it. He says, here, no, here's a box of C rations, you know, get rid of this, get rid of it. You know, you don't need this, you don't need that. You need this, get rid of this. And, um, and I had five quarts of water and two bandoliers of, of ammunition and only 18 rounds in a, in, a, in a magazine because the spring pressure, if you put a 20 round, 20 rounds in a 20 round magazine, it would, it would jam the M16. You didn't want to take any chance on that. And then I was turned into an assistant machine gunner, so I had to carry a 50 round belt of M60 ammo. And, um, you know, when I loaded everything up with my web gear and, you know, the fragmentation grenades, I didn't want to carry one hanging on my, on my uh, web gear up here. For some reason, I had this superstition of, you know, I didn't want to, you know, if it got hit by a bullet or something, you know, I didn't want, to, want it exploding in my face, you know. Uh, so I carried them in an ammo pouch. And a, so I began this ritual of how I was going to carry my stuff. Mm -hmm where I could get to things that I needed and needed them, you know. And, um, and by the time I hoisted all upon my body and started to walk down the dusty road to the, to the helicopter pad on, on this mission, you know, I was um, um, over what I considered my fighting weight, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle. And I thought, what am I going to have to do if I have to run, you know. But, um, but we had a, you know, a little wiry kid that humped the M60 machine gun, and he carried uh, 400 rounds, a belt mm -hmm. of, of M60 ammo in ammo pouches, plus another 100 rounds. He carried 500 rounds. He had 75 pounds of M60 ammo plus the gun, plus his, his web gear, plus his food or a poncho or whatever, you know. I mean, we carried, we carried a lot of weight, you know, for, for humping in, in these rugged mountains. And, um, and as we walked down that dusty road that first day, um, you know, I remembered these rabbit hunts, you know, it was quiet. I could hear the, the sound of the boots as we, as we walked along the dusty road towards the pad. And it reminded me of the crunch of snow, you know, going on a rabbit hunt as a kid, you know, in the big woods, you know, in uh, Lowe's Woods, Illinois, you know, and I thought, you know, this is a different kind of hunt, you know, this is for pay. And, uh, and I ended up sitting on the, on the first bird. And I learned this is the way it the way it worked, right? My squad leader sat there and he had a red smoke and a green smoke, and um, and I sat watching him because if we, if that LZ was hot, he popped red smoke. That was so the second bird who was coming in pulled off, and the third bird which was a lighter bird, would come in to pick up the guys from the first bird. But you couldn't hear anything. And the guy next to me in the doorway of the Huey was sitting on his helmet. And I knew what that was for. Rounds coming through the floorboard, you know. And, um, 
And as we went out, they had, the procedure was artillery would prep two or three LZs with rounds so to confuse the enemy so they never knew which one we were going to. And then as we got ready to make our combat assault in, the two Cobra gunships would come on either side of the front, the lead bird, and then they would release their rockets and their, their 40 mic mic, their 40 millimeter uh, uh, exploding like li little hand grenades in their, in their mini guns. And then as we came in, the door gunners opened up with the two M60s. So it was, it was noisy. You never knew. And at that point, all I wanted to do was get off. Of course, the door gunners, you know, as you got close, they go, 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 go. You know, and you go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I don't want to, you know, he didn't want to die, but I don't want to die either, you know. And, um, and wait till you get close enough to jump off. And of course, when they come to extract you, they go, come on, come on, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up, get on, you know, because they, you know. And um, so all I wanted was for the helicopters to be gone just so I could concentrate on the sounds, you know, what's going on, you know, are we in trouble or are we all right? And, and then when you see the green smoke, then you go, oh, things are okay. Now, you were assigned as an assistant gunner. Was that was that helpful to you? Because you just follow him, and then you you kind of had a good idea what your job was. Right. My job. My job. I was an infantry. Uh, I was a, a rifleman in second squad. Mm -hmm. Right. So so my job was just as a, an M, you know, M sixteen, just a rifleman. Mm -hmm. But as as an assistant gunner, I was the the, the second assistant gunner. The first assistant gunner wore two belts of M60 ammo. So if the gun ran out of ammunition or or the gunner yelled ammo, he crawled first. And if they then if they still needed ammo, then I went. Mm -hmm. Right? But the gun was a target. Yeah. You know, the NVA wanted to kill the radio and kill the automatic weapon. That was that was a target. And um, so I liked the gun, but I didn't necessarily want to be too close to the gun, but, right. you know. All right. So, uh, so you've got to des describe that. You describe that, that first mission. Okay. Uh, and then how long did you spend uh, serving with that unit? Did you join them in March or so? Probably. Yeah, right. Up, up until, you know, when it was time to go home, middle of July. Okay. You know, and I had spent a night or two on Ripcord, and, uh, and I wrote about it uh, in my memoir. Um, All right. Uh, so you had the first mission. Now, are there other particular oh, missions and experiences that you can oh, yeah. stand out for you? Yeah. So oh, keep going with plenty, the story here. Yeah. Plenty. I was, you know, um, after 25 combat assaults, they gave you an airman. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for that. And if you survived the hot LZ, that was an automatic air medal because that was dangerous stuff. And those guys, you know, were not throwing out medals to the low-ranking soldiers quite the way they did their upper-ranking uh, buddies, you know. Um, so, so you knew you earned that. And, and if you, get, you got a bronze star, I mean, that was just like being in the in a wrong place at the wrong time and making good and getting out of it, you know. Um, but um, I should have had orders for probably maybe five or six air medals for hot LZs and, and at least over, there was over 50 combat assaults that we made because we were air mobile mm -hmm. and, and being in, in these, um, the, the, the small units that we operated in and when we would bump into the enemy, Recon was blown. I mean, it was over. They knew where we were, and we knew where they were, and, and they would, we would get extracted. So we would either be taken to a fire base overnight and then reinserted the next day, or maybe go back to Evans and be reinserted. You know, so we were always, you know, moving around. And um, all right. Uh, now, did your unit take casualties? Once. Out of all of this time, these guys were so good. And I knew of all the units, and if I was being punished, 
you know, for having the wrong attitude in the rear and, and sent um, into the field, they couldn't have sent me to a better place. We had, a, we had an E-7 sergeant that was third tour of Special Forces. And when he first came for his third tour, they assigned him to our platoon. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and old Clancy was, uh, he was top notch. And uh, you, you, you see what I'm saying? So there was seasoned combat uh, soldiers in the platoon and every, after every mission, we would go back to our little um, EM club and, and while we drank, drank beer, you know, we hashed it over. How do we make this better? What went wrong? How do we tighten this thing up? You know, this machine had to work um, effectively and efficiently and, and, um, and if, we, if we could make it better, we made it, we did so. And, and as we lived with each other, we got to know each other and you knew when a guy's uh, shit was weak, as we say, excuse me for the language, but, um, and it was pointed out, if a guy got too loose, you'd say, hey, your shit is weak, you need to tighten up, or, or it was new, too noisy, or, you know, didn't have the right stuff that he needed, you know, it was pointed out, you know, for, not only for his safety, but for, for your safety. And, and uh, no one wanted to see anybody get hurt, let alone have someone make a mistake and, and, and I end up hurt, you know. So we became very good at what we did. And uh, like I said, we were, when, when a line company would come back into Camp Evans, they turned their weapons into supply, you know. And, uh, but when we came back into Camp Evans, we kept our weapons because we were on a 10 minute standby. 24 hours a day and we just replenished our rucksacks and just got ready because we never knew when we were getting the call to go again. So that's, that's the way life was. And on one mission we had gone out as a six-man team to bolster another six-man team that had been in the field. And it was a kid that had just come back from Ricondo school. And it was a special school they wanted you to have, I think they really wanted you to have, uh, you know, maybe five or six months before they let you go to Ricondo school. So they would train you in, in a more specialized small unit operations and, skill, and gave him a skill set that he could take back to his unit, his recon unit or his LERP you know, long-range reconnaissance ball patrol unit um, to augment that and give them skills where they can, you know, set uh, trip flares and, and, you know, or whatever. And this kid was back. He was, he was, he was seasoned, you know, he was a good soldier. And, um, and, um, and we set up the MDP and I was watching him and, and I offered to help him because I wanted to learn, you know, if I can learn a skill here and he didn't want me to help him you know he was a little wary of me because we didn't we didn't know each other you know really um but i you know i i went and sat by him because he moved out a ways you know just for security you know while he was setting trip flares you know for for nighttime approach you know so we would know we were getting somebody was stumbling upon us and, uh, and the next morning, uh, a squad leader had said, um, you know, anybody got an empty canteen they want filled, you know, um, this guy is going, I call him the Ricondo. I, even in the book, I didn't want to put his name in. I just, you know, because he was shot and, uh, and died. But um, he, you know, the, so the Ricondo was, was going to go for water. And... Um, so, you know, some of us that needed water, we gave, gave him a canteen and um, he was going to go with a point man and one other guy and they were going to go down because in the mountains, if he went down, which was our standard operating procedure, if you went down, you found water, you know, and, um, but he was shot, um, never got out of our uh, night defensive position and, um, and all hell broke loose. 
and um, and there was an explosion behind my head, and I felt something brush the short hair behind my head, and I I went into this. Um, I just stepped out, and my childhood flashed before my eyes. And I was in the Badlands, you know. I was four, and my cousin Nan, who was eight, we were building a fire out of stones, you know, pretending, you know, in the Badlands of South Dakota on a, on a family trip. Just stuff like that, you know. And then I was jerked back to reality because my gun was hot, you know. Um, so how long I was gone or firing or whatever, I, I, I don't know. Um, and we tried to get him extracted in, in the first medevac that came. Um, you know, there was no, no place for him to come in. It was, you know, double, triple canopy. Mm -hmm. And they tried to put a jungle uh, <laughs> penetrator down to get him. But he was taking so many rounds, losing oil pressure, and finally the squad leader yelled at, at, at uh, uh, one of my buddies and said, you know, get on the horn and, and call him off, you know, because he was ready to, he was either going to have to be called off or he was going to come down on top of us. So he, his dilemma was, this is my friend who gave me his R&R &R money to, to watch. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to, he didn't want to take it, but because it was a, f a friend of his, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. it almost, it, whether a premonition or what, you know, and he, he just felt terrible that he was calling the medevac off. Mm -hmm. and, and he couldn't quite do it. And finally the squad leader ripped the handset out of, out of his hand and, and, and got, got the guy out. But they had called in another one, so there was another one coming. And, um, and then they needed someone to take our wounded guy up. And he asked for a volunteer, you know, and I was just that close to saying, you know, I'll do it, I'll help the kid, you know. And because uh, I was older, I was 23. And most of the guys, you know, I was like an older brother. Mm -hmm. and, but I, what do I know? I don't know nothing, you know. I'm not only am I new to, to, to this whole shebang that we're caught up in but I'm a kid myself you know and uh, you know because they they would come in and say hey Al you got to go and they gave me the nickname Al because I was drafted out of Chicago so it was like Al Capone okay. you know hey big Al you got to go and help up you know you got to go by this guy you know he's drunk two days you know or something you know and I said well you know but I would do it you know and then he would say Things like, I'm going to be killed, you know. My childhood, went, my life went before my eyes. And I said, oh, is that all? Well, that happened to me. And he'd go, that happened to you, Al? Oh, and then it was all right, you know, because I was older. And if it happened to me, then he could do, then it'd be all right for him, right. you know. So I would help the guy, you know. See. So they finally... I was that close to, to offering my, my help, but I thought, geez, you know, I don't know about being a target, and I hesitated. And we had this kid we called the Limey. He was a British kid and uh, my, emigrated to America and joined the, the Army, and, and he volunteered and took him up. And it was the bravest act I, I think I ever seen. But for us to get out of this, place we were in, they called in a, a what's called a red team. It's two Cobra gunships. And they essentially walked point for us back down the trail to the LZ that we had landed on. And on the way in, I remember getting really scared because I lost the guy in front of me on this almost nondescript trail and because it was so thick. And I thought, you know, you kind of speed up, try to find find the guy, you know, to make sure you're not lost. Because I didn't know, you know, when you can't see the sun, which way do I go? Which way's north? Which way's 